So uh, welcome to the Women's Health Seminar Series. Uh, uh, we have today Dr. Alan, Alex Berenstein <laughs> today. Um, I'll do a land acknowledgement first, recognizing that many of you are not in Vancouver or in Canada, but we recognize that we live, work, play, and participate in a community on the unceded, ceded, and traditional territories of the 203 First Nations, along with the 38 Métis chartered communities, each of which possess their own unique traditions and history here on this land that we now refer to as British Columbia. We acknowledge the importance of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada's call to action, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, and the BC Declaration of, on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act. In all of our work, we are committed to ensuring Indigenous women's rights to health and safety and the equal opportunity to participate in a manner that recognizes and respects Indigenous cultures and traditions. Today, as I said, I'm joining you from, actually I'm in North Vancouver right now, which is also part of the unceded homelands of the Coast Salish peoples and the traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations. And I encourage you, no matter where you live uh, across the globe to uh, look up the indigenous peoples uh, within your area. So this is part of the Women's Health Seminar series. We've been running it for now for almost three years or three years exactly. Uh, who are we? We're over 340 members worldwide, um, including about 100 or so uh, UBC faculty members and affiliated members, but we also have community partners and a number of trainees, amazing trainees that we have. Uh, we run a number of events and I put some uh, that we'll be running this year. Uh, in 2022, we have a Women's Brain Health Conference that Jesse Lacasse will be helping with. Uh, we hope it'll be in November. Uh, and it'll be on hormonal contraceptives and the effects on brain health. We, uh, Elizabeth Rideout, who is a major donor um, through our sex, CHR Sex and Gender Chair, will be running an SGBA conference. For those of you not affil uh, affiliated with that term, that's sex gender based analysis. Um, and in uh, March, we'll have a UBC Dialogues, uh, Lost in Translation, it's not exactly called this, but I have SGBA versus women's health. So how it might be just the first step to understanding um, some issues in women's health. And I just wanted to mention we have, some amazing uh, trainees. We have awards that'll be coming up really soon. Um, we just put in our renewal for funding again. So depending on how that goes, uh, we'll, we'll dictate our awards, uh, but uh, do uh, become a member because you have to become a member to get those awards. And we have a podcast, women's health a podcast and a women's health blog that are run by trainees. And I just want to give a shout out to them because uh, the podcast was the third most listened to just started in September. And it was the third most listened to podcast um, on the um, UBC medicine uh, network, which is amazing uh, for such a young podcast. And the blog was just voted number eight worldwide for women's health across the world. So uh, I am very, very um, excited to um to tell you that. So now I need to stop sharing so that uh, Dr. Berenstein can put his slides up while I introduce him. Sure. Um, so uh, Dr. Al Alex uh, Berenstein, I didn't know if I could do that again, is an associate professor in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at UBC, and he's an investigator at BC Children's Hospital. A major focus of his lab investigates both the cellular and molecular processes that direct tripho trophoblast cell biology and early placental development. Um, he uses state-of-the-art cell isolating techniques and three-dimensional culture systems uh, to investigate this. So uh, he is, uh, I guess I would say, uh, well-funded, uh, well-published. I don't have all of those metrics on my sheet here. Um, and we're really lucky to have him as a speaker today because he, uh, in his, his household was just joined by another <laughs> uh, person, little person. Um, and his fun fact is that he likes coffee a lot. I mean, I think most of us probably like coffee a lot and caffeine a lot, but uh, Alex takes it to a different level. <laughs> He even roasts his own beans. So he roasts his green beans on a weekly basis. And I, I think he said something about his wife uh, 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 wondering about that um, particular, but I think that's an amazing fun fact. And thank you for that. And over to you, Alex. Yeah, thank you, Lisa. Yeah, no, it's a, uh, I guess my wife, it's a smoky endeavor roasting beans and she puts up with it because uh, it makes me happy. But I get that support from her and so that's all I can ask for. Uh, and I also just want to, extend my thanks to, to, to you, Lisa, also for inviting me to give this talk. You, you know, reached out to me about a year ago. And uh, at the time, you know, I was looking forward to, to doing it, but I, I was on parental leave for four months. And uh, I'm back. 
So it, it feels nice to be back in my office. It's a heck of a lot easier actually working than taking care of a kid. Um, and actually work taking care of a kid is severe work. Um, it's like I'm on a vacation right now. Um, so um, I'm more than happy to prevent some of my, it's, it's kind of a work in progress that I'm gonna be doing today uh, with a heck of a lot of kind of background to kind of lead up to where I'm at. Cause I know that this is a, an interdisciplinary group of people. And, uh, and the type of work that I do is, uh, I guess it's, it's, it, it is kind of fundamental kind of developmental biology work. So it's sometimes it's, 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 it gives you a fun opportunity to be able to kind of translate some of the work that I'm doing. Um, and uh, I hope that everybody enjoys, um, or at least finds it interesting. So, okay, so this, I actually Googled this a couple of months ago um, for a talk that I gave, um, Oh, geez. I think it was the beginning of September. And so I asked Google, because you'd be surprised how few people really um, know what a placenta is. And, and so a good place to start is maybe to ask, you know, your, your, your good friend Google. And um, so I asked Google, what's, what, what's a placenta? And, you know, when you Google things, you can also look into what other people have Googled or Googled or asked questions that are related to your search. And so people also ask if you, if you, you know, that's related to that question is why do people eat the placenta? What side is the placenta on if it's a boy, which might be, I guess, kind of appropriate for today's talk. Um, what does a placenta taste like and what is in, I, I, this is my favorite one actually, because you can kind of take it two different ways. What is in the placenta after birth? So, um, yeah, it just kind of, I think, highlights really kind of, you know, how the public kind of understands what a placenta is. And, you know, I think more disturbingly, if you, if you look at also some of the images that you, that are associated with that, with that term or that question is that, you know, there's a lot of interest in terms of consuming placental related products for various health, I guess, reasons. And I, I'm not a clinician, but I, I could tell you right now that I would probably stay away from consuming placentas, particularly raw placentas. Um, you know, maybe some of the progesterone that's in the cream that you drive from a placenta could be beneficial to your skin, but I mean, I, I don't know. I, I would definitely stay away from it. But if, one thing I do know a little bit about is, is I guess, uh, what the placenta is, and, and a definition that I do like is, is an old one. It's from a, a physiologist, uh, Hartland Mossman, and he defined this in 1937 as an, the placenta being an apposition of fetal and maternal tissues for physiological exchange. And I think that's a pretty accurate representation of what the placenta is, but it also, I guess that question does not necessarily support a lot of the stuff I'm gonna be talking about today being that um, this is, so in this, this definition would suggest that it's actually a combination of, of, of maternal and fetal tissues. And we'll get into that in a bit. Placentas come in all shapes and sizes, uh, which is kind of an interesting thing. Um, very different say from a heart, or a spleen or, you know, kidneys. And, and so, you know, developmental differences from between Eutherian mammals is, is quite amazing in my opinion. And so on the top left, you have a human placenta term. That's actually my, my first daughter's placenta. And in the middle, you have a top middle, you have a, that's a baboon placenta, which looks a little bit like a human placenta, I suppose. And uh, top right, uh, that's, a, that's a mouse placenta. And in the bottom left, you have a, that's a cow placenta. And then floating in the ocean, that's a, that's a whale placenta. So, you know, eutherian mammals, placental bearing mammals, um, they have different types of placentas. And one of my, the peeves that I get, and actually I got this from my most recent uh, CHR grant reviews, is that one of my reviewers said, you have to have an animal model if you're studying placenta. I'm like, well, I'm trying to study human placental development and cellular pathways in the human placenta. You know what? The only closest species that have the same cell types that we have are baboons and chimpanzees. I don't think I'm going to be doing my research on baboons and chimpanzees. Thank you very much. So yeah, just that's one of the gripes that I have. Like, you know, rats and mice and guinea pigs are, you know, they, they do serve a purpose. But in, if I'm looking at cellular pathways and placental development in humans, they're not very good. Um, so if you want to study the human, you got to study the human. Um, but this is a human placenta right here. Um, that's the fetal, what's sometimes referred to as the fetal side. Um, you can see it's, it's a very uh, vas vascularized, um, you can see the umbilical cord on the top, uh, but it's a, it's a very vascularized uh, organ. Um, and if you take a cross section of this and look at 
I guess, the uh, structure of it, you can see that there's almost like a tree-like villa structure. And each of those little uh, villa uh, branching points is called a, a cotyledon. Um, and they're clonogenic in nature, meaning that um, they're thought to arrive, arise from a, from, a, from a common cell, each, each cotyledon. Um, and as, if you look in this little red circle, you can kind of see uh, this, this kind of blocked out space around, around the tree, and that's called the intervilla space. Um, and if you look really carefully, you can kind of see a spiral. Um, that's, that's actually a little artery. It's a maternal artery going into that intervilla space. That's called a spiral artery. And that's where all the maternal blood gets injected, essentially, into this intervilla space. And those floating villi like, that you see there, that's where all, those, all the, the exchange occurs between the maternal and the placental interface. Um, and so oxygen, other types of nutrients are able to either passively diffuse through, through the placental membrane or actively um, through various active transport systems as well. So it's a, it's a pretty cool system it's, and it's very different than the mouse. Um, so the maternal side, uh, this is the cotyledon. Uh, they're called cotyledons. You can see those individual structures. And then the human, there's thought to be somewhere around 25 of these uh, at a full term. So here's a question, and I know that this is on Zoom, but uh, we can use emojis, right? Um, so because this is a biological sex or genetic sex type of talk, um, who does the placenta belong to? And you can use either like a thumbs up emoji or a, a clapping emoji to kind of vote um, on what you think. And I'd be kind of interested to kind of just see, um, and maybe, maybe Lisa can kind of capture that. So if you, um, so if you voted, and I, I, I see some people clapping, which is good because I like to see um, I like to see differences of opinion here. Um, so the placenta's genetic information belongs to the biological parents. Um, so you know there's ethical considerations if you're ever working with placentas. Uh, genetically, though, the placenta is the same as the babies. So um, it's you know the placenta arises from the from the blastocyst, and and so the outer part of the blastocyst is called the trophectoderm and also, there's, a, there's another subtype of cells called the extra, extra embryonic mesoderm. So the combination of trophectoderm and extra embryonic mesoderm contribute to most of the cells in the placenta. And those are the same genotype as the fetus. However, epigenetically, so I, I don't know if Dr. Robinson or, or Dr. Brown are in the crowd today, but um, its developmental trajectory is, is, is a little bit different from that of the, uh, the developing embryo. And it's... Uh, and I guess also when you relate, when you consider, uh, you know, working, I think with uh, with uh, longer term health trajectories of how the placenta relates to health um, of a, you know, of, a, of an adolescent or, or an adult even, you know, the biological parent isn't always the parent. So, you know, there's a lot of things you need to consider when you're, when you're dealing with a pregnancy and parents and, and, and children. So yeah, the placenta is genetically either male or female, and I have a little star there because that's typically, you know, typically male or female. But like all humans, it can also have other viable um, sex chromosome makeup. So for the most two common ones being Turner syndrome, a single X, um, or, or Klinefelter syndrome, which has an XXY. And you can get those. Um, they're rare. Uh, the the two Turner syndromes and Klinefelter syndromes make up less than 0.2% of all live births. Um, so you, so that, so, so, do, do, so genetically, they're not male or female, um, but biologically, that's a different question, right? So I think uh, that's a, it's a really interesting uh, thing to think about. When so genetically, an X plus an X individual is not female, even though, but biologically, they would be female uh, from 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 a different kind of perspective. Um, but what are the ramifications of fetal and placental sex from a clinical standpoint? Because at the end of the day, uh, health research have to, health researchers have to some, at some level kind of justify, you know, it might be interesting biology, but how does it impact us from a from a health standpoint? And when you're applying for funding, like myself, um, although I think biological sex differences are super cool from a from a basic science perspective, why? Why would I study this? What, what, how is it going to be potentially translatable? Or how does this impact us from a health standpoint? Well, spontaneous preterm birth, especially early preterm birth, has a, has a male bias. And this is the caveat to that, though, is that most of the studies in the past have focused on populations that are predominantly Caucasian or white. Um, and when you have a more mixed or diverse population, uh, that association does not hold up as well. 
early onset preeclampsia. So this is a, for those of you who are familiar with preeclampsia, it's a, it's a hypertensive condition in pregnancy, it arises after 20 weeks gestation, and it's very detrimental to the, to the, to the mother. Um, uh, and early onset happens before 30 weeks gestation, it has a strong female bias. Um, smaller babies, and again, depending on how you slice what is the S small for gestational age versus a fetal growth restricted baby because there are, there are differences, um, they tend to have a female bias. And that could be par partly because female babies are just generally smaller um, than male babies. Stillbirth, so do you have a strong um, bias towards being the male? And an XY. Um, so you can see that there are at least outcomes of pregnancy that have associations with, with genetic sex. But you know, does the placenta does the placenta play a role in the development of any of these outcomes? And some people would say yes, definitely, um, because the placenta you know might play a role in the development of preeclampsia, could potentially play a role in, in um, instances of preterm birth. Um, but you know, a lot of the work that we do in, in humans is associative, and and so I think ultimately we don't know, um, although there likely could be. But you know, I'm a cell biologist, a developmental cell biologist by training. Um, hence, I'm not wearing a suit. <laughs> um, and I'm interested in, in, uh, in taking a step back and asking more fundamental questions about the impact of biological sex on, on placental development. And to do that, I, I'm just going to give a very brief overview of, of implantation and early placental development. And so shown in kind of brown, um, that's the, the uterine epithelial wall. Um, and you can see that implanting embryo. So you have uh, the inner cell mass, which is shown in kind of a kind of a turquoisey green. Um, you have the trophectodermal outer layer shown in, in, in purple, but also kind of white. Uh, and so during implantation, which occurs about 10 days after ovulation, um, you, you have this kind of already heterogeneous composition of trophectoderm, which has a mononuclear inside and a, and a multinucleated outside and it invades right through this epithelial surface of the uterus. Now, if you zoom ahead um, to about 12 weeks gestation in pregnancy in a human, um, this is how the attachment points of a placenta look like if you zoom in. So you have what, are, this is a floating villus that is now attached. Uh, there's an attachment point um, shown in different colors of purple. So you can see if you see my cursor, this is called an anchoring column. And you can see these cells extending off this column and they're evading right through the uterine stroma. And these cells actually interact with blood vessels and call these maternal blood vessels to increase in size to deliver blood right into that intervillous space, which you saw earlier. Now, the earliest parts of placental development, you know, occur at around four weeks gestation. And so, it's thought that a lot of issues that might go on, go wrong with placental development are thought to occur in this kind of early window in time. Right here in this red, indicated by that red box. But overall, you know, the, the actual biological processes that are occurring in this window of development, or in the human anyways, are extremely poorly understood be, because of the ethical considerations that you could imagine in studying a process like this in humans. And because of that, most of the research in terms of, in, in terms of studying the placenta is focused towards the end of pregnancy. So, you know, or at term, 39 to 40 weeks gestation. And in terms of the developmental biology perspective, you don't learn a lot from something that's already developed. You know, for, for any cancer biologist uh, in the crowd, you don't study a tumor that's already formed. You want to study the lesion if you want to study how it develops. And it's the same thing with the placenta. If you want to understand how it, how it develops and potentially how things may go wrong, in development and how that might translate into potential pregnancy related issues, you don't necessarily want to look at a term placenta. You want to look at something that's actually developing. So origins of biological sex differences. I'm just going to take a, a slightly different gear shift here. And how, how do, I guess, genetic sex differences, how, how, how can they um, manifest into actual differences? And so genetic differences, you know, can obviously stem from having an X or a Y, having an extra X or a Y chromosome. So, and again, the, the numbers I'm showing here, I don't think are accurate, um, but they're kind of in the right ballpark. And so on, on the X chromosome, there's roughly about 840 protein coding genes and more non-coding related genes and, and some pseudo genes as well. On the Y chromosome, fewer, um, but there's a, approximately about 70 protein coding genes. 
And there's a lot of similarities between those ones on the Y to the X. They, you know, they, there are some genes that are, that are um, um, autologous in nature, but there are some that are distinct. So the most, um, I guess, no, well, no one would be that SRY gene that's involved in, in, in testes development. It's not expressed. There, there's no equivalent in, 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 a, in a genetic female. But what's really interesting is that many of those X-linked genes, uh, uh, you know, genes on the X chromosome, they, they have immunomodulatory um, uh, roles. And, and so that's kind of neat when you think about that, because there's a, there's a process that can happen um, where, um, where there's a X, X chromosome inactivation that happens in, so, for, so genes are expressed on the X, uh, you have two Xs in, in females, and to prevent multiple, like overdosing of, of the expression of, a, of an X-related gene, there's a process called X chromosome inactivation. But not all those genes are always inactivated. There's a level of escape that can happen. And that's called, uh, that's referred to as X escape from X chromosome inactivation. And depending upon the tissue, the cell, it can range. Um, and it's thought to range up to 30% of X-related genes, which is quite a lot, because the X chromosome is a very big chromosome. Um, and, and escapees include amino, immunomodulatory factors like uh, FOXP3, which is expressed in subsets of immunosuppressive um, immune cells, um, the interleukin-2 receptor, uh, the gamma subunit, uh, to like receptor 8, for example, um, and also a number of genes that are involved in regulating genes, so like histone remodeling enzymes. So you can just right off the bat, you can kind of already kind of see not only, you can see how there could be genetic related differences uh, in males and females just by having an X, an extra X, or having a Y. Another thing to consider are steroid hormones. Um, and it's particularly in the term in, in, with respect to development, because development in, in males is, is testes development occurs quite early in, actually in pregnancy within the first trimester. Um, and one of the thing, one of the features of, of testes development is a spike in, in the production of testosterone. Um, and uh, this occurs in, in a very narrow window during development, approximately eight weeks gestation up to about 14, 15 weeks gestation. And then you see this really big spike in, in, in androgen levels, testosterone, and, and within um, specific cell types, uh, dihydrotestosterone, DHT. And, and presumably, the androgen that's produced gets into fetal circulation. So for a very, I guess, uh, defined limited period of time, the fetus is going to be exposed to high level, the male fetus is going to be exposed to high levels of androgen, whereas a, a female fetus is not. And that's going to be involved in the androgenization of, 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 the, uh, of the fetus, but also um, all that uh, perfusion into the placenta might also impact cells of the placenta as well, how they interact with androgen. And for those of you who are familiar a little bit with androgen-related signaling and, and, and biology, um, and for that matter, any type of hormone, a steroid hormone, um, you know, immune, immune modulation is a pretty important, um, I guess, outcome or feature respect, uh, with respect to steroid hormones, as well as metabolism. So there's, there's a lot of interesting biology that could be impacted from a biological or genetic sex point of view. So what I have here is, this is an older paper that was published in 2014 using, uh, this is a transcriptomic uh, analysis using gene microarrays. I believe 300 term placentas were assayed here. This is from a group in Australia. Um, for those of you in the placental realm, uh, this is from Claire Roberts's lab. And so just looking at, this is a differential gene expression of specific genes. So blue are, are those genes that are overexpressed in males, red are overexpressed in females. Um, and you can see that there's not a lot, but there's a, there's a number of genes that are differentially expressed in whole tissues of, of, of term placentas. And as you would expect, like exist, for example, you would be likely overexpressed in, 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 in female um, placentas because it's involved in X chromosome inactivation, for example, in, in females. It's expressed on the chromosome that's being inactivated. Um, this is from another study. Um, this is in first trimester placentas, and I believe it's around 39, almost 40 samples. Uh, and again, uh, these are whole tissues. Again, this is using RNA sequencing, though, a slightly different uh, technology. 
And you can see they, they show the number of genes that are expressed on individual chromosomes here. And what's really interesting, so you can see that there's 16 genes expressed on the Y, so not a lot in this particular study. Um, but what they do show is that, you know, in, in the female um, and in the male placentas, that they do get, they do observe differentially expressed genes. Some of these are autosomes. Some of these are also genes on, expressed on the sex chromosomes. And it's really interesting to see the differences in autosome genes between sexes, because I mean, as, as I indicated earlier, some of those genes that are on the X do regulate genes potentially, and they could potentially be really, really uh, regulating autosomal related genes. So it's, it's neat how you have these genetic sex differences stemming from X and Ys, but they also potentially could impact autosomal um, chromosomes as well. If you look at the uh, at the X, which uh, these are some of the genes that are, I guess, upregulated. Some of them um, are known genes to escape X and activation in, in females, and shown in, in, in blue. Um, so there's uh, those that are also X and activated. Why they would be overexpressed, I don't know. Um, and then interestingly, you do see some genes in males on the X that are overexpressed too. So part of the problem with some of that work. And I mean, it's, I think it was necessary work and it does show that there are differences that provides a lot of really interesting biological insight. But one of the problems with, I guess, um, whole tissue analysis of, of whether any type of omic analysis of a whole tissue is that it doesn't take in consideration the, the cell types that exist, the, the complexity of cells that, that are within a, within a tissue, an organ. Um, and within the last five, six years or so, there's been a lot of advancement with respect to how we kind of assay or how we uh, measure the, the heterogeneity of, of cell composition in cells. And uh, one of the approaches that my lab has used is called um, single cell transcriptomics. And there's a bunch of different platforms out there. And what I'm showing you is the platform that I'm using. It's, it's called the 10X genomics platform. And what it allows you to do is, is it allows you to um, capture a cell um, and within that cell multiply thousands or hundreds, or there are some studies that look at millions of, of individual cells. And from each cell, you're able to generate a, what's called a cDNA library. So that's kind of the RNA, um, the mirror of RNA that you can then sequence. And so this workflow just shows you broadly how it's done. So first you need, if you get a tissue, for example, what you need to do is to get that tissue and break it down into a single cell composition. Um, and so, you, use, you can use enzymes, that's what my lab does, and we break, we generate a single cell suspension. From that, you feed this in, into this pipeline right here where you have the cells coming in, these little, um, these little white things, and they're encapsulated within this uh, a bead. Um, a bead kind of holds onto them. And then within this little lipid droplet that forms, there's also a bunch of uh, chemistry that's injected. And so this chemistry is uh, basically, um, it lyses the cell, uh, uh, and, it, uh, and it also generates the, the cDNA. So you'll be able to sequence it. It also provides a little like um, tags that allow you to kind of track where that cell came from, for example, and, and, to, and to identify that cell. So once, it, once all that's, uh, once you generate these little, what are called gems, um, then you can actually um, send them to a sequencer um, and, and get the individual uh, cells sequenced. And so you're able to actually kind of go back and the next slide I think shows it better. This is work from my lab. Uh, you're able to actually identify individual cell types within a, a very complex organ, in this case, the placenta, and look at the gene expression that each cell type has in relation to all other cell types that were sequenced. And so the work that I'm showing here, this is work that's been that's taken place over the last five, five years, I think. Um, so 11 first trimester placental samples, doesn't sound like a lot, Seven came from the BC Women's Hospital, and four came from a published data set um, from Cambridge University. Um, and within this, we had five XYs and, and six Xs. And following quality control and data pre-processing pipelines, uh, we were left with around just shy of 51,000 cells that were captured in sequence. Um, and they're plotted, plotted here, and this is, is, a, is a high dimensional reduction um, projection or this particular one is called a UMAP. Um, and you can see um, each little number corresponds with a state or a cell type. And so these cell types are identified by the genes that they express. So known cells or types of cells express a, a known gene signature. Based upon that inference, you can kind of then I go back and identify the type of cell that it is. And one thing what you can really appreciate here is that you have 
Um, we can identify different types of immune cells. We could identify different types of stromal cells that exist in the placenta. And these are those trophoblasts that originate from that trophectoderm that come from the placenta. And just to give you a little bit of background and context with respect to what's what, um, here you have um, cells. Um, these are those, this, these pink cells right here. Uh, they're all clustered together. Those are the thought to be the progenitor cells of the placenta, and they can give rise to two populations. They can give rise to this multinucleated layer called the syncytium, and that's where that interface between the mother and the placenta is, where all the physiological exchange occurs. And then there's another pathway that leads to this, these blue cells and these yellow cells. And those are those anchoring or column cells that can give, give rise to these more invasive features, more invasive cells that are able to physically interact with maternal cells because these cells become quite invasive, almost like, like tumor cells, and they can interact with stromal cells and immune cells of the mother um, in, in pregnancy. And so this was actually just recently published in, in the Journal of Development. It, it shows, um, yeah, the, comp the, the overall, I guess, uh, a mapping, if you want, the cell mapping of, of the cell types that are in the placenta, first trimester placenta. If you focus in on, on the uh, trophoblast component, we show that there's roughly eight sub, not subtypes, but states of cells. And so you have um, these cells. So if you look at the key right here, these purple cells are those more invasive cell types. Um, these are those extra villa cells that interact with, uh, with the maternal compartment. And then these blue cells right here, although they're not the multinucleated cells, these are the cells that are just becoming or likely differentiating into that multinucleated uh, phenotype. These are those cells that are going to be probably coming those, becoming those um, cells involved in physiological exchange. And then you have a whole whack load of these cells that, um, that these ones in the middle, those are those progenitor cells called cytotrophoblasts, and there are different subtypes there. You could probably appreciate a little bit better. So we did, this is called a, uh, a cell trajectory modeling. Um, this particular um, analysis is, is called um, single cell uh, velocity. And so this one's based upon, I guess, states of RNA processing. So you can have mature and, 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 and more latent uh, uh, states of RNA. And so you can kind of infer uh, what is an earlier state, what is a later state, and then you can go back and, and look at and, and kind of predict what is the most earliest cell type that exists or the most primitive cell type. And so here you can see that this right here, this green, uh, this, this, we call it the origin. That's likely where those stem cells in the placenta, those, uh, the, that, that state of cell is likely very enriched in stem cells. And those cells can then differentiate as different, along different trajectories. And I'm, I'm not showing it here because I'd have to go and show you um, a, a video or we have it on an HTML program. We can actually spin this around because you can kind of see these cells going into the abyss, but these, these cells actually kind of wrap around and come up here. Um, and so they kind of feed into that, that, that invasive pathway as well. So there's more than one trajectory to get to one place is what I'm trying to say. But now what's really interesting is how, what happens if we break this according to uh, genetic sex? And, and so again, our numbers aren't huge. Um, so we have about 3,600 um, female cells and we have about 4,000 male cells. And what you can see is that if you just look at the overall broad composition uh, of these various states, is that they, they you know, they, they fit the same kind of UMAP projection plots, which is, which is nice to see, but frequencies of cells do seem to be different. And so, for example, in the male, you have a much greater expansion of, of, this, of these two progenitor types of cells, these ones shown in red and this kind of, a, kind of rusty brown color, which correspond right here. In the female, it's a bit different. You actually have an expansion of these more invasive subsets of cells, these extra villus trophoblasts. Those are the ones that interact with the maternal compartment. So, you know, I, I, I want to take this day with a little bit of grain of salt because, you know, a lot of what we can be looking at here could be related to capture, cell capture efficiency. Um, so that might not at all be related to the biology. It could be, it could be a technical artifact. Uh, and the only way to get around that is to get more samples and to and, and, and to and look at the composition of the breakdown again. Um, but but it does kind of maybe suggest that there are differences in composition of cells just based upon the genetic sex, whether it's a male or a female. So using another modeling tool, this one's called Monocle 2. Uh, pseudo, it's called Pseudotime. So again, it's it's looking at it's pre, it's predicting. It's a, it's an algorithm that predicts like the trajectory of a cell from from beginning to end, um, of, in terms of different how it differentiates. So you have an early progenitor stem cell state, and then you have an endpoint. 
um, you know, a terminally differentiated functional cell type. And if you look at the, what the invasive pathway that these progenitors, some of these progenitor cells um, differentiate along, um, just to remind you, you have these progenitor cells right here and they become these column cells and they eventually become these invasive cells. And as they go along this pathway, they upregulate the expression of this gene called HLAG. Um, and when we apply this to a pseudotime uh, algorithm, you can kind of see that if you look at the numbers on the bottom, um, male cells, male EBT become EBT faster than female cells. Um, so from a pseudotime perspective. So that could be one of two things. It could mean that, um, that could mean that male cells, male progenitors differentiate into these invasive subtypes of cells faster, or it could also mean that um, there's more stages, more steps that a female cell has to go through in order to get to that endpoint. So time might not be affected, um, but, but there's a difference with respect to the, uh, I guess the linearity of how a progenitor cell becomes an endpoint. Um, extra bilis trophoblast between a male and a female. So I thought that was kind of interesting. So if you kind of go back and ask that question again, you know, or, you know, so female XX and, and male XY differences in pregnancy outcomes. So XY fetuses and placentas, um, they're thought to be more responsive or at least more sensitive to uh, infection and inflammation. So male preg uh, pregnancies with a male fetus, they tend to not do as well if there is a severe infection. Um, and that's thought to be because male fetuses or placentas may upregulate more pro-inflammatory factors to fight that infection. They might result in getting rid of the infection, but also impacting them, the, the pregnancy itself too. Um, so this possible difference may help explain why, for example, there are slightly higher incidences of spontaneously, spontaneous uh, preterm birth in, in XY um, pregnancies. And I guess the question I have or, you know, for my own research program is, could this observation be at all related to any sex-related differences that could be driven by trophoblasts? Because if you recall, uh, you have some of these trophoblasts, particularly those, particularly those invasive ones, they're interacting with the maternal immune system um, in, in the uterus. And so if there's sex-related differences in how those cells interact with immune cells, that could be an interesting thing to look into. So that's one of the things we did is we subset some of the we, we, we focused on a couple of genes that are known to be immunomodulatory. Um, and I'm just showing two right now. Uh, one is that HLAG. So HLAG is expressed. It's, it's, a, it's a type two MHC molecule. It's expressed on the surface of uh, these invasive extra villus trophoblasts. And it can bind to a couple of different receptors expressed on immune cells. Um, it's, it can interact with macrophages uh, and it could also interact with uh, a type of cell called a uterine natural killer cell, a UNK. Um, and it's thought to primarily promote a immunosuppressive or an inhibitory signal um, to immune cells. And as you can see, um, females, uh, the, the, column as, the column cells that start expressing this HLAG, um, they express more of it than, uh, than males do. And there's another uh, receptor that we were interested in. This one's a soluble receptor. It's actually a decoy receptor. We'll get into it in a bit more later on. But also similar, this is actually more interesting in some ways. It's, it's expressed almost threefold, fourfold higher in, in males, in male EBT than in females. And uh, what's really interesting about this gene is it's not expressed in mice or rats. So if you're studying, uh, again, how, uh, how a potential immunomodulatory mechanism is impacted in pregnancy or impacting pregnancy, in this case, you have to use a human model um, because it's not the cell type does, a, no, not, does not exist in a mouse or a rat. Um, and the gene that we're studying in that cell type is also not expressed. Now, the beauty of single cell RNA sequencing is that we captured a lot of different cell types and that um, the data set that we got from Cambridge um, also has a lot of uterine cells in it too. So we were able to... Uh, not only infer the biological sex of the trophoblast, but then also cor correlate the different cell types that exist in the maternal compartment as well. And so if I just kind of remind you, if you look at my cursor, these are all those immune cells. The ones that are shaded in gray, those are all coming from the maternal compartment. 
And the only immune cell that we're able to identify within the placenta is, is the macrophage, which is a Hofbauer cell, um, shown here is in number 14. That's a, those are those Hofbauer cells, which are kind of interesting. But the, all these other cells up here are primarily uterine NK cells. There's a subset of general T cells um, and also different types of myeloid cells as well. So particularly macrophages and monocytes that you know, there could be resident macrophages there, but there also could be monocytes coming in from the periphery. And so one of the things that we did is we just did, again, a differential gene expression of these various um, cell types, of genes expressed in these various cell types. And shown in this heat map here, you can see these are, some, there are more, I think there was about 30 different genes that we showed to be different. And I'm showing here, it's about 10, I think, 10 or 12. Um, What's interesting is that there are some genes that are more like, highly expressed in male um, M2. Well, these are, it's not an M2 macrophages. We just call it macrophage number two from RNA sequencing. Um, there's also T cells that show uh, different. So depending on whether it's an XX or an XY. So XYs, uh, they express some pro-inflammatory factors at a higher level than, than the XXs. And similarly, some XXs express um, some chemokines and, and some factors that are thought to play a role in placental development anyways, uh, at higher levels in male cells. Uh, UNK1s, these are the, the most pro, I guess, the most abundant type of natural killer cell in the uterus and are thought to be the most, most, more classical type of natural killer cell. Uh, they express consistently higher levels of pro-inflammatory pro factors over um, natural killer cells that are in contact with, uh, I guess, a, a female pregnancy. So it's, it's kind of interesting. So these cells, keep in mind, they're all, they're all XX cells. These are all cells coming from the maternal compartment, but they are influenced by the, potentially by the placenta. Uh, or, or cells of the placenta that could be either XX or XY. So they're, they're, we're not looking at male or female immune cells here. What we're looking at here is maternal immune cells that are impacted by the pregnancy, whether or not it's from a female or a male um, placenta, um, which is kind of kind of cool, right? Um, so I just have to, I basically summarize what I just uh, what I just stated earlier is that maternal immune cells from pregnancies with a male fetus express greater levels of cytolytic granzyme H, for example, antiviral genes, genes associated with innate immunity and, um, and some natural killer receptors. Uh, maternal immune cells from pregnancies with a female fetus express higher levels of trophoblast modifying chemokines like CCL5, CXCR4, and tissue remodeling and pro-inflammatory cytokines like interferon gamma and IL-1 beta. So and IL-1 beta also being a very classic uh, pro-inflammatory factor as well. Now, if you recall, we talked a little, I talked earlier a little bit about that gene called layer two, and I want to come back to it because I, I'm kind of interested in it. So layer two is a collagen receptor, but it's secreted. And, it, and it's a, so it's a, unlike, it's um, a very similar um, receptor called layer one, which is also a collagen receptor. Layer one is expressed on the surface of most, I don't know if all, maybe some, I, I saw Sylvie Gerard in the crowd. She's, a, she's an immunologist. She might be able to answer that better than I can, but I think it's expressed on most immune cells, layer one. Now, it's thought to function as a decoy receptor because it essentially it prevents the interaction of layer one binding to collagen. And when layer one, uh, when it binds to collagen, it, it initiates a very strong inhibitory signal to the immune cell to, to, to quiet it down, to not be so cytotoxic, for example. So um, layer two being that decoy receptor and preventing that interaction of layer one with collagen is therefore thought to be a, um, it, it's thought to enhance immune cell activity. So if you have more layer two in a system, chances are you're gonna have less layer one induced activity, meaning you're gonna have a higher um, active state of immune cells. And just to remind you, um, males, um, male uh, trophoblasts, particularly those invasive ones, uh, those EVT shown right here express a lot more layer two than female EVT. And so that it's a secreted factor, remember, and those cells are in the decidua. Those EVT are actually in the decidua, mingling with those immune cells. And if they're potentially depositing more layer two into that environment, they could be modifying the behavior, the activity of those maternal immune cells that are interacting with those cells. So we did an, we did an experiment as, a, as some preliminary work. And what we did is we got some peripheral blood cells. So uh, from, from a pregnant person, um, these are PBMCs. Uh, so these aren't uterine immune cells, so there's a big caveat there. And what we did is we got these immune cells, 
and we uh, culture them in the presence of or, ab or absence of collagen. Um, so we plated, plated collagen on a plate and we put these mixed population of immune cells on this plate. And then we treated them with or without recombinant layer two. So layer two being that soluble factor. And what you can see here is if you look at all the, excuse me, all the different uh, types of cells based upon different markers of, of immune cells that we were looking at, you see that uh, the, the, here are the non-treated cells. You can see that when you treat them with layer two, their overall features change, meaning that layer two, layer two is having an effect on some aspects of frequencies of these cell types. We also looked at specific markers of activation. Uh, this particular one we looked at was called CD69, which is just a measure of activation, kind of a general broad activation marker in many immune cells. And we looked specifically at monocytes and here, uh, natural killer cells in the peripheral blood. And what we showed is that when you throw on layer two, is that you actually increase this activity. So this sort of provides some good, solid, some beginning evidence to actually you know, provide some insight into what an increased amount of layer two might be having um, in, in a pregnancy, in a, in a, that's, that's it, that, where the fetus is a male. So currently my lab is working on um, testing how layer two might affect immune cell activity, uh, particularly in uterine immune cell activity, because if you remember that was done on peripheral blood um, mononuclear cells. So those are cells that you get from a, from a blood draw as opposed to the cells that reside in the uterus in pregnancy. And we're, we're examining what happens when layer two is, is potentially when we silence it um, in trophoblasts. And uh, we're, we're co-culturing those silent cells with uh, different types of immune cells that we get from the uterus. Another thing we're interested in um, is, is, you know, when you look at the, at the end of the day in a, in, a, in a healthy pregnancy, there's not a lot of differences between a male or a female outcome. Um, but I think what's more interesting is what happens if, uh, if a pregnancy is challenged, particularly challenged with something that elicits an inflammatory response, right? And so a lot of those genes from the X, for example, are immunomod immunomodulatory, where, you know, that we are, right now I'm showing you that EBTs in males express this pro-inflammatory layer two. So what would happen in the context of, of an infection, for example? Would you think, a dip, would, would, a, would a placenta that's male versus female, would it act differently in the context of an infection? And so one of the things that we're doing is we're modeling that um, in, by testing um, different compounds, different factors. So L lipopolysaturide or LPS, LPS, which is a gram negative bacterial um, component that's, that elicits uh, an inflammatory like uh, response. We're also, also looking at poly IC, which is a viral, like it, it, it mimics uh, viral RNA. So in the context of viral or, or, or bacterial infection, how do these systems, these co-culture systems, how do, they, how do they respond? So we're doing that type of work right now too. I know I don't have a lot of time left. I just want to touch on the last couple of, one last interesting thing that my lab is doing, uh, stemming again from some of the hypothesis generating stuff that we're doing with our single cell work. And that's focused on um, uh, the gene of, that encodes for the androgen receptor. And what you see here is, so just a, as a context again, here is that, that origin. Those are, those are those stem cell enriched state of trophoblasts right here. And, and if you look at the expression of androgen receptor, you can really see that male um, trophoblasts express androgen receptor, not only in more frequency, um, but specific to those, uh, to those progenitor cells, those um, stem cell enriched cells. Um, and so why is that interesting? Um, well, androgens show um, sexual dimorphic levels um, in, in development, as, as I alluded to earlier. Um, maternal androgens are kind of interesting, but uh, the placenta is a really good barrier. It has, expresses a lot of aromatase. And so any androgen that comes in contact with the placenta likely is converted to estrogen through aromatase. So the impacts on, of, of maternal androgen on the stem cell niche it could happen, but it's perhaps not as likely. What's likely more interesting is the fetal androgen component. And so, you know, fetal androgen, androgens play a big role in testes development, and they're tenfold higher um, in XY fetuses of between seven to 14 weeks gestation. Um, so that very defined window in development. So I guess the question I have is, well, what does that, what does that do in terms of uh, the stem cell niche? You know, is, is, uh, is the androgen engaging the receptor in a different way? Is that leading to um, differences in biology of the progenitor pool in a male versus a female um, trophoblast population? And so we're doing some of that work now too. Um, 
you know, and, and, and this is partly why is because again, going back to the single cell data, you can kind of subset based, uh, based on genes and subtypes of cells. And here's a, an androgen receptor, uh, an androgen receptor uh, signature of genes. And so what you can see here on the top is male, as, as, as I already said, male uh, trophoblast progenitors express more androgen receptor. Um, but androgen receptor signatures are also higher generally in these uh, male cells, um, suggesting that androgen is engaging the androgen receptor and likely having a biological effect in these, in these progenitor cells. So there is a, a focus on my work as well that's, that's kind of interested in that. So just to summarize, um, you know, genetic sex does lead to gene expression differences in placental cells in different subtypes of placental cells. Genetic sex also um, Im impacts the cellular composition potentially, um, so the heterogeneity of cells, in, 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 and that's related to genetic sex. And lastly, genetic sex may result in XX and XY differences in how trophoblasts communicate with the maternal environment, particularly the immune cell component of the maternal environment. And so I just want to thank the people who did a lot of this work generating the preliminary data for this work, um, and also um, the BC Women's Hospital, the care program that has provided us the, the tissue samples to be able to generate all this data. Um, I want to thank my research associate, who, uh, Barbara Castellana, and then also um, Jeanette Baltieva, Matt Shannon, Jasmine Wachter. Those are the people who did a lot of the single cell and, and collection of samples and processing in immune cell cultures. Um, I also want to thank some of the more the alumni, uh, Dr. Lee, Maru, Lauren, and Jenna, who also did a lot of work with the single cell stuff because it did, we did start this about five years ago. So we, as you can see, there's a lot of people who are no longer in my lab who have contributed substan substantially to this work. And then also some of my collaborators as well. So uh, Dr. Robinson, who has played a really fundamental role in um, a lot of the discussions as well as designs and, and questions that are being asked. Um, and then also uh, Dr. Francis Lynn here at the BCCHR, um, who has really helped my lab kind of step into the realm of single cell omics. And so, and then of course the funders, um, the money comes from, has to, has to come from somewhere. And I've been, I'm super grateful for the support I've got from NSERC, uh, CIHR, and also the BC Children's Hospital. So I'd be happy to ask, ask any questions in the remaining time we have. Oh, thank you. That's so, I agree. Emily just said fascinating work. I was just going to say the same thing. That was so fascinating. And I stopped tweeting because I didn't want to like, you know, I, even though I know this kind of work takes so long and is so complicated, I didn't want to um, give too much of your unpublished stuff away. Um, uh, but it was, re I really, uh, I have so many questions for you, but uh, I'm also cognizant that I'm only one person. So um, before we get to questions, though, if people don't mind doing the little animated clapping, that's always very nice for speakers to see, because otherwise it's just these black boxes. So thank you very much. You got some claps. And I'm sorry, I was not very good at the uh, thumbs up versus the claps. <laughs> I was like, I was going to vote myself. And then I was like, oh, no, I've got to look at everybody. So uh, so I'm glad that you were able to do that um, yourself. That was really uh, really, really fascinating. So I do have some questions. Emily has one too, but um, if people have a question, you can put it in the chat or you can unmute yourself and ask the question. That's totally fine. We're trying to make it a little more interactive. So it's not just a talking head here, but um, Emily asks, did you notice any sex differences? And yeah, well, this was one of mine. Like, you know, I am biased, right? We all have biases and mine is like, Andrew, just, yeah, they're kind of interesting. But, did, you know, I'm always curious about, um, you know, the other side of things. And one way to interpret that is looking at estrogen receptors. So did you, and obviously a lot of the sexual differentiation actually does go through the estrogen receptor. So I'm just wondering or through that pathway through that, did you look at that at all? Yeah, and actually, that's a really good question. And one of, actually not the last, so this grant, basically a lot of this data that I presented is kind of preliminary data to a grant that's been to CHR three times now. Um, and one of my reviewers did ask that question the first time around, thankfully, um, and because it is a really important question. And and because androgens don't signal, uh, sorry, not androgens, steroid, steroids don't uh, signal necessarily in isolation. So yeah, I looked at that. And in the context of the trophoblast, it's really bizarre. The androgen receptor is, other than the uh, corticosteroid receptor, are the only two steroid receptors that are expressed. Um, the, the estrogen receptor is not expressed in any of those trophoblast subtypes, which was kind of surprising. Mm. That's, yeah. That's good, yeah. I wonder though, I wonder, um, you know, maybe that has something to do with the steroid levels in the mom, right? In the maternal environment. And because they're so high, 
estrogens and a variety of them maybe maybe it's like a maybe it's a protective mechanism really i mean maybe that's why yeah well there's so if you look at the other cell types because that's just the, from the trophoblast component but if you look at the other cell types yeah there's there are there's a lot of expressions the er um and um but uh and and there are some subtle differences depending upon whether it's from a male or a female uh pregnancy so yeah there's 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 that angle too to look at um which i didn't touch upon today no and you can't do it all i, I know that uh dr Berenstein can't do it all <laughs> so and you got to start somewhere so um i completely understand that what about um what about the timing so all, all, all of this work here i think was in the first trimester is that correct yeah um, so yeah, yeah the earliest samples we have are six weeks gestation yeah. the uh, latest are about 13. And are your samples, because uh, you can imagine that if it was a disrupted pregnancy for different reasons, that could also have an impact on the results you get. So do you, do you look at things like that? Like why, yeah. why you have the sample? So that's a really, that's a really good question. And also that's a, that's a critique that we, that we, that all people who study stuff from the first trimester get, because, you know, instances of spontaneous pregnancy loss are pretty high. You know, yeah. they're thought to be, you know, 25, 30% even. Yeah. And so, you know, there's a decent chance that the samples that we're studying in the first trimester likely would not have made it to term. You know, there's a 25 to 30% chance. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that you can kind of get around that by looking at um, congenital issues. So, so if you look at, uh, if you look at any major congenital types of readouts, you because the majority of those pregnancy losses uh, are do have a congenital component to them, um, so that's one of the first things that we look at is, are you know what what what's the ploidy? Right, um, right, 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 right. right. Uh, and so the samples that we look at are are are, are normal that way. Mm -hmm. um, the other things we do is we, you know, we we look we try to maintain as 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 a homogeneous population as possible. So one of the things we do is. Um, we try to take into to affect the, the health of, of the mother. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we, we limit our analyses to those samples that, that are from, from uh, pregnant people that, are, that have a very defined, say, for example, BMI. Uh, we also look at um, C-reactive protein, which is a measure of inflammation that we get from the blood. So those that have a very high CRP, that might be indicative of an infection. We don't look at those either. Um, and so we try to, you know, they're not perfect, um, but at least it, we go, so we try to make an effort to try to limit our analyses to what we think, based on the information we have, are as healthy as possible. Um, uh, yeah. Okay, uh, Emily has another comment too, which is also very good, actually. Um, but uh, I was just going to uh, sort of in the last two minutes here, um, ask you one, well, I guess it's actually more of a comment, so I could do Emily's comments than of mine, but, but I have the calm, so, and Emily didn't go off speaker, so I'm going to do it anyway. Um, I, so one of the things that I've been really interested in is in the maternal immune environment for maternal, uh, maternal health rather than um, how it affect influences necessarily child health, although that's coming a little later. But one of the things I've noticed in the literature is that no one in the human literature, then no one seen, oh, there might be two studies out there, but very few even look at fetal sex as a, as a factor. So what, what would you say to that in terms of um, how that might be influencing results? I mean, you're also showing, hey, the placental sex might actually <laughs> directly yeah. really influence maternal yeah. immune cells, right? So yeah, and my lab's guilty of that too. I mean, for, you know, we've, we have a handful of publications that we've looked at maternal immune, I guess, readouts. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, gen genetic sex is something that we haven't really taken into consideration. We are going to be doing that now, obviously, for moving forward, because we, we do see that there are likely differences that could be in part related to the genetic sex of, of the fetus and placenta. Yeah, but you can also go back to your own data if you, yeah, if you uh, still have it and look at and look and see, hey, did that did that make a difference in terms of Yeah, I think it's always a, it's a good thing to do. It's it's a it's a relatively straightforward thing to look at. And and there's so there's in some ways no reason to do it. I, I guess the one caveat is is that number. So like power is often cri yeah. criticized. Like right. if you have a sample size of only 10 or 12 samples, right. and if you stratify those to sex, then you know you some of the findings or differences that you may find related to sex or not may or may not be real, right? Right, 
I, yeah, I know. I would just, um, the, and again, this is my own bias. You know, people always use a power excuse, always. But I, I, I like to just see it in a table or something, yes. something, desegregate it, don't, whatever, whatever you want to do. But just let, for those people that are really, really curious to see, hey. And so that way we can look at across a wide, wide variety of studies and see, hey, is it, does it seem to be the same yeah. equate? It, you know, it might, it might not have any role whatsoever, but I just, I find it curious. That, oh, I 100% you know, agree. Yeah. And, and, and the other thing I'll just say about that is that the data is so mixed, like the uh, studies out there are so mixed, it's hard to find a good picture of what's going on. And so I wonder if that part of that is our sort of lack of attention to, to fetal sex yeah. and, and or placental sex. Um, thank you so much. I'm kind of I try to get people out by, by exactly the hour. So we're, we're done. So if you wouldn't mind, thank you I, again. Uh, if you feel like clapping, you can clap or not clap. But thank you, that was really great. And uh, I learned a lot about um, the placenta. Uh, and uh, uh, I can't wait to have you again in, I don't know, a few years so you can tell, tell us the, the rest of the story. And I wanna to talk to you about stem cells because we see this, we see some real sex differences too in terms of stem cells in the hippocampus and the adult rat. Yeah. But anyway, that's, that's for another. <laughs> yeah. story so thank well, you very much yeah, thank you for having me it was my pleasure yeah